So the uh, title of this presentation is The Integral Age, How Empirical Evidence of the Spiritual Realm Could Catalyze the Emergence of Integral Consciousness on a Collective Scale. And before I really delve into this, I want to um, just see if I can help to create an opening for us to experience, um, you know, the origin or the eternal present, or, or the eternal future, you know, because I think we can access it even, I mean, it's, it's ever present. So it's here, you know, it's available. And so how do we acknowledge that possibility, that reality and feel the stillness, you know, that's available. Uh, and then also um, recognize in that stillness, the accessibility of that reality. You know, however subtle it might be. Um, because that helps to transcend, you know, any kind of mental, rational kind of thinking that goes on, you know, the egoic preoccupations, um, impressions, feelings, distractions. Uh, it just allows one to just drop into a level, um, you know, the ground of it all. And so I invite us to try and do that, you know, and um, to just sort of hang out with our own inner psychic being, you know, which, which is um, um, you know, always connected to that reality. So, uh, I mean, if you won't mind, just, you know, closing your eyes, as most of you have already done, and just kind of resting here, being with your breath, you know, and allowing things to just settle, to just settle into, you know, that ground. Um, and notice that, you know, with each out breath, there's an invitation to relax. Uh, and just feel that and just, you know, let it, let this be a kind of vacation for your mind. You know, there's nothing to figure out. There's nothing, nothing to think about. There's nothing to do, but just to rest. And keep your awareness on your breath. You know, that's the anchor for the mind. Take a couple of deep breaths to kind of really deepen into it. And notice the settling that happens with each out breath. And in this stillness, you know, Feel the reality that we've all been kind of talking about and pointing to. It's so silent. You're ready, you can open your eyes. So, you know, here we are. Um, so this, you know, I don't know 
a whole lot about Gebs's thought. I've hardly read a few pages of his ever-present origin. Um, but everything that I've read seems to me to be very sort of uh, familiar, you know, uh, just from other readings and experiences. And um, so I think a lot of what I want to share today might be tangentially related to what Gebsa has stated. Uh, but I think it'll make sense, you know, um, just coming at it from the perspective of uh, divine love, you know, as the foundational reality uh, of existence. And, um, you know, that origin is uh, um, uh, is the source of divine, is divine love, is, you know, is the source from which everything has its, existence. And so uh, if that is the foundational reality, then why does it allow, well, not allow, I mean, how does it, how does it um, hold, you know, the, the complexities and the difficulties and the pain of um, you know, time and and especially our moment, you know, how, how does it see it? Um, and if we take that seriously, if we take that reality to be a very serious reality, then, and if we are fundamentally that at our root, you know, at the root of our awareness that we can access through that kind of, you know, mindfulness and sort of just dropping into that awareness, then, you know, it can help the, you know, it can help our ego have a nice little um, uh, ground to rest in, to feel reassured by. Because without that, the ego freaks out and is not able to really confront what it uh, perceives. And, and so, I also wanna, oh, this is difficult. Um, Please. No, no, but it's just, it's hard to keep track of, you know, everything. Um, so along the lines of this idea of divine love as the foundational reality, you know, uh, there's a Sufi, uh, I mean, the philosopher, very famous Pakistani philosopher, uh, Muhammad Iqbal, you know, some of you might be familiar with him. Uh, he's the one who sort of even conceptualized the whole idea of Pakistan, you know, and he's the national poet of Pakistan and very influenced by Whitehead. I mean, he, Nietzsche and, you know, he studied in the West. And uh, so he was one of those figures, you know, um, and a great poet. And so some of his lyrics uh, point to all of reality as being a, a court of love, you know, and he says, in this court of love, give birth to your um, place in it, you know? And I sort of interpret that more as discover your place, you know, discover your contribution, discover who you are in this court of love. I mean, in, in a sense, we are the court itself, uh, but we also have you know, a unique vantage point within that court, you know, as evolving beings. And, and so, you know, uh, that leads to the idea that this entire court is kind of each coordinate of this court is 
monitored and programmable, you know, um, this multi-dimensional coordinate, you know, is, you know, so that um, wherever you are in this court, you are with that reality, you are with that, you know, um, monitoring, you know, and what's monitoring it is this inner being. Um, and, you know, like, I, I mean, if you can just conceive of it, like even now, right? Uh, every detail of our situation is known to something, you know, to the a perspectival, you know, uh, I think according to Gebser, uh, like I can imagine this being sitting somewhere, the controls and kind of having all this data, you know, relating to each coordinate and each being occupying, uh, you know, a, a unique set of coordinates. Um, and so if that is a kind of reality that is real, then, then the, I think the more that we drop into it, the more that we can uh, approach whatever we encounter from that perspective, even if we're not aligned with that consciousness in every moment, at least we have the memory of it. At least we have the cognition that even though we don't experience it, we know it's there. You see, so that takes the pressure of feeling it all the time. You don't have to feel it all the time. You can't, we can't, you know, we can't do that. But we can at least remind ourselves that, you know, we have felt that before and we know what it's like and we can imagine that it's present even though we are unconscious in that moment of it. So where was that leading? Uh, I guess, yeah, so that I think completes that thought. Um, now, how does this relate to, you know, um, the subtitle for this, for this presentation, the empirical evidence of the spiritual realm? You know, because um, as I said in my, in the abstract, you know, these kinds of subjective experiences are, you know, often um, uh, relegated, you know, I mean, all these kinds of spiritual experiences are often relegated to just, you know, either subjective experiences or religious doctrine. And they're not really able to be um, taken seriously in a kind of, um collective setting you know you can only point to it and you can only sort of but the dominant kind of approach is um not taking into account that reality and so um you know i uh so so um i'm just gonna read a few things that I've not uh, sort of noted from Gebser, uh, just to sort of set it up. Um, so the eruption of the uh, a perspectival, you know, as the mental structure began to intensify and reach its limits, Gebser observed that cracks or disruptions started to appear in its framework. This is the eruption, a sudden emergence or breaking through it signifies that the previous structure is no longer sufficient to contain the entirety of human experience, leading to the emergence of a new structure. The aperspectival mode of awareness embraces multiple perspectives simultaneously without pri prioritizing one over another. This means that there's a move towards integration where various viewpoints are synthesized. Implications. The eruption of the aperspectival world for Gebser holds both promise and peril. On the one hand, it presents the potential for a more integrated holistic understanding of the world, transcending the limitations of rational dualistic thought. On the other, the transition can be accompanied by chaos, disorientation, and the breakdown of previously stable structures and ideas. So we've already been through this, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, next, uh, 
let me see here. The a perspective consciousness structure is a consciousness of the whole. This is a direct quote from Gebser, an integral consciousness encompassing all time and embracing both man's distance, distant past and his approaching future as a living present. The new spiritual attitude can take root only through an insightful process of intensive awareness. This attitude must emerge from its present concealment and latency and become effective and thereby prepare the transparency of the world and man in which spirituality, spirituality can manifest itself. So latency, what is concealed is the demonstrable presence of the future. It includes everything that is not yet manifest as well as everything which has again returned to latency. Since we are dealing here primarily with phenomena of consciousness and integration, we will also have to investigate questions of history, the soul and the psyche, time, space and the forms of thought. Since the second part of this work is devoted to manifestations of the new consciousness, the first part must clarify questions relating to the manifestations of previous and present consciousness structures. We shall attempt to demonstrate the incipient concretion of time and the spiritual dimension, which are preconditions of the aperspectival world. We shall also attempt to furnish evidence of the increasing efficacy of that spiritual reality, which is neither a mere psychic state nor an intellectual rational form of representation. This will bring about the validity of our second guiding principle, and that's transparency, diaphaneity, which is the form of manifestation, epiphany of the spiritual. So this is again a quote from Gebser. Our concern is to render transparent everything latent behind and before the world. You know, again, talking about that world, that, that reality, you know, that, that's monitoring and that's sort of... Um, uh, ever present, you know, um, to render transparent our own origin, our entire human past, as well as the present, which already contains the future. We are shaped and determined not only by today and yesterday, but by tomorrow as well. The author is not interested in outlining discrete segments, steps, or levels of man, but in disclosing the transparency of man as a whole and the interplay of the various consciousness structures which constitute him. This transparency or diaphaneity of our existence is particularly evident during transitional periods. And it is from the experiences of man in transition, experiences which man has had with the concealed and latent aspects of his dawning future as he became aware of them, that will clarify our own experiencing of the present. So if we take this seriously, you know, then we can, we can experience that ever present future. And we can become conduits, sort of drawing that reality into the present. You know, this is not to ignore what we are confronted by, but to see in it the possibility of its ultimate sort of, I don't want to say progression, but ultimate destiny you know, to see everything that is now in disarray and, um, you know, uh, chaos or whatever, like uh, unconscious um, um, expressions or embodiments, you know, imagining their becoming whole, you know, finding their place in the court of love. Like that is real. That's that's going to happen. And that's what we have the opportunity to really witness and hold, you know, before it becomes manifest, you know, to see through the mask that it is, you know, wearing right now. And to really feel that reality, you know, it's hard, it's so difficult, you know, but we can practice and we can do it more easily when we do it together, you know, when we know that there are others doing that 
same work, you know, when we, so we can find that kind of connection to each other, you know, in that realm. Um, and, you know, I mean, I got, I came back to this area after six years and I, it was heartbreaking to come back and to witness how things have changed. And, you know, my uh, experience has been to run into people who have been embodying exactly what I just said, you know, fearlessly, you know, uh, not confronting, but, but, but holding, you know, this reality. And so I know that it's happening, you know, already. I just want to highlight that so that it can happen more. You know, um, so yeah, I guess I can move on now. Five minutes? Okay, perfect. So this is a photograph, you know, that I discovered in the year 2000. And it came to me as a tremendous reassurance, you know, because if you can notice what's over my head here, is a kind of flash of some kind of light that is of a spiritual nature. And, um, you know, I was one and a half years old. My dad took this photograph. And, you know, to me, it just, it, it kind of uh, made visible what I had been hoping was real. You know, and I had been hospitalized for things that I had felt so intensely, but that others could not understand. And they hospitalized me and pumped me full of medication, you know, and I, le I left after three weeks because I made a gorgeous painting and I stuck it on the wall where the doctors and nurses met every week so that they could see I'm not nuts, you know. And so that they could get a taste of what I was really kind of feeling. And that week I was let go. I mean, it was like, yeah, you're free to go. Um, but when I came out of the hospital, I got a job, I got an apartment, I started working, you know, but I was not happy. I was really depressed. I was in New York City. And, um, and, and then I said, you know, I had these old photographs. A cousin of mine had just left for Pakistan and left his scanner with me. And so I scanned in these old photographs of me because I knew I was cute. And so that would make me feel better about me. And so in one of those photographs, I discovered this. And immediately, you know, I was reassured. And so, you know, in, in you can also see that there are, whoa, that there are these eyes here. There's an eye right there. And there's an eye right there. And there's all these flipped eyes in here, you know? And this is kind of this eruption, right? This comes out of this dark spot. It kind of just bursts through. And then as it does go back, you see, it creates another opening for itself. And as it goes back, it sows its, the, the, the tears gets sewn back up, you know? So all of this is happening in a flash. Um, and it's, and it's kind of right, you know, it's just like goes all the way down, you know, to, to here. So, yeah. And, um, you know, so, so, you know, I, I've been, I've been observing the world from this kind of intense, you know, uh, perspective for 23 years now. And this is like one of the first times that I'm sharing this with, you know, people in general. I mean, I've tried to share it in the past, but people would just shut it down and ignore it and say, oh, optical illusion and get freaked out, which I understand, you know, it's a little freaky. But for me, it's not because I've had so much time with it. Um, but so, you know, I think this helps to for me, me to just know that something is going on that we you know 
we can access, we can figure, you know, not figure it out, but we can, we can really feel it. Um, like this roller coaster ride, there is someone, something, some, some plan, some destiny that's holding it together, you know. And the more that we can feel that and bring that to our daily lives and whatever we encounter, you know, I mean, that's I think the only work that I really want to be doing. So, um. I think what, what yeah. I wanted to have some sort of um discussion space, but I guess we could do that in yeah. But there's only one minute left. So um but I, I just want to say one more thing. So when I was one and a half, my name was Imad. So when I was born, the name that I was given was different from Sami. It was Imad, which means pillar. You know, and I have a kind of there's a pillar like quality in this photograph is like standing strong. Bob Pillar. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so and but but the thing the story goes that I kicked my grandfather when I was two years old, because my grandfather, a very respectable man, you know, met Chairman Mao, you know, like big personality. And here I was a two year old kid and he was getting angry. My grandfather was expressing all this anger and I kicked him and I gave him a real good kick. My mother tells me, you know, and he was and then he directed his anger towards me and I was not phased by it. I stood my ground, you know. And he was taken aback and he was like, his name is too powerful. You got to change his name. And they changed it to Sami, which means all hearing. But they thought it would also mean one who's receptive, one who will listen to us. You know? And so my friends in college used to joke that I'm like a fallen, broken pillar. You know, which I've definitely felt because I have recordings from me at three years, you know, where I'm still confused about this name change. Um, and so anyway, I just thought I'd put that in because it's like, you know, it's a recovery. It's a kind of, you know, coming back into it. Um, and so anyway, thank you so much for your attention. And yeah.